Well, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be the, the representative of my class. Um, I come from the engineering side, so I'm going to talk about a little bit of engineering and medicine today. But uh, what I'll start with is sort of the basic concepts that have emerged from more traditional areas of uh, engineering science. I'll begin to say a few words about uh, simulation-based engineering science and then talk about computational mechanics, which is sort of code words for uh, traditional theories of mechanics and uh, physics that are uh, utilized these days on computers, large-scale computer modeling. And I'll give just a uh, set of examples that illustrate some of the things that have been done over the years and then use that as a segue as to how these techniques are being now utilized in uh, medicine. In medicine, I'll, I'll describe this idea of the predictive paradigm. What it, what it really means is you're trying to predict an outcome for a particular patient rather than a statistical outcome uh, over a broad uh, range of uh, experience. Uh, I will emphasize cardiovascular modeling, and I'll just do an example from uh, left ventricular assist devices. But there are many different uh, applications that are being studied by my group and many other groups around the world. So let me uh, quote a few uh, statements from a recent uh, NSF report. It was on simulation-based engineering science. It, it starts off with a rather floral and grandiose a statement saying computer simulation is now credited with numerous triumphs in the 20th century. It's indispensable in engineering analysis and design, and it's fundamental to many scientific areas, predicting weather, climate change, behavior of the atmosphere, microelectronics, defense, et cetera. Uh, but it does seem to be on the threshold of a new era. And some of the application areas that are uh, emerging from this are in the biosciences, in particular medicine. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the subject of my talk. <clears throat> so I'll begin with some very, very traditional examples. This is one I did many years ago. You can see it's a, a very aerodynamic looking train. In fact, it's the forebody of a bullet train uh, from Japan. Uh, if you see down in the lower right, there's a company named, there, uh, named Nippon Sharyo. They're a company that makes bullet trains. And um, they were a company that had a, a very uh, experimentally oriented focus. They weren't really early adopters of computer technology, as you see utilized here for the design. But they were uh, very much concerned about acoustical requirements in Japan. The environmental laws are very, very stringent. And uh, they had built a laboratory to study the acoustics of these high-speed trains, which generate a lot of noise. And uh, they built an anechoic wind tunnel that uh, permitted them to study the acoustics. They had to build a special building with special walls. Uh, they built models of uh, trains and shrouds. They put them on tables. They had big fans, sort of like a wind tunnel. And one of the first full-scale uh, full experiments that they did, they got the wind tunnel up to speed. Uh, they blew the uh, table and the uh, experimental shroud uh, right through the wall of the building. The wall fell down, then the building fell down. <laughs> then they called me and said, we think we'd like to get into the area of computer modeling. <laughs> <laughs> well, computer, computer modeling is utilized in many different areas these days. Crashworthiness of automobiles is a very important area. Uh, this is a Mercedes, as you can see here. I was involved in uh, work like this that was uh, a number of us in the pioneering work that was done in the early 1970s. The first calculation we did of a car, which was not a sophisticated model like this, uh, cost more money than the experiments do of crashing a car. And that caused all the funding agencies to immediately stop work in this area. About 15 years later, though, this was the standard technology. Every automobile company in the world uh, utilizes computer simulation. They have hundreds of analysts doing models like this every day. Um, and if you look at the, the, the drop in uh, deaths in, in automobile accidents, it's actually incredibly significant. It's about 20% overall, despite the fact that there are many more drivers, this is worldwide, and uh, many more miles that are driven per driver over these years. So it's, a, it's attributed to this, uh, this type of work. Uh, one of the interesting things is now that the precision in these models is so great 
they correlate actually better with full-scale car car tests than the initial prototype experiments which are based on tooling that is not as refined as that for the actual cars this is an example of the troll platform this is one of the greatest engineering works in history it's the largest man-made object that was ever moved it was moved a considerable distance it was built and then taken out to sea and installed on the ocean floor as you can see from the size of this it's not possible to do any type of prototype experimentation it's completely computer designed now this is still successfully in operation right now it supplies about 10% of all of Europe's gas consumption there was a another platform that did implode actually and it was due to a modeling error now this is another example of crash simulation this time it's a train and I since I'm an engineer I have to give you some practical ideas about life if you travel on trains where should you sit if you don't want to have a bad experience during an accident I would suggest you want to sit in the middle of the cars this is this is an example from earthquake engineering it's of a model of you can see the Southern California area Los Angeles San Diego the Salton Sea is this lake area over here and this is an earthquake model and what you're seeing is sort of the decomposition of how large models like this that are very very refined are distributed over parallel computing which is sort of the the theme of modern computing many many processes linked together to solve very very large problems so this is a nice simulation and I'll show you what it tells you about where to live in Southern California this is a simulation of slippage along the San Andreas Fault you can see it's by the Salton Sea by Palm Springs it's traveling northward and you're getting tremendous ground motion so this is a 3d model of the elastic properties of of this area then you see the the waves start to move out obviously you don't want to be living right on the fault but you see how the waves move out they just keep moving away but there are focal focal areas and you can see which city is going to get the worst of it it's Los Angeles and I used to live up there in the Pasadena area many years ago and I'm kind of happy I moved to Austin Texas recently that shaking goes on for about five minutes in that area long after the earthquake has occurred this is an interesting calculation this is a fluid mechanics calculation as you can see it was done by Ron Fedke at Stanford and a lot of this technology is now utilized in the entertainment industry in the games industry to make realistic visualization and you know you can get many awards for for work like this and one of them is the Oscar Ron Fedke got the Oscar for doing the water scenes in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies okay on to medicine and engineering so they're both problem-solving disciplines but they've really utilized contrasting paradigms historically medicines based on diagnosis you make predictions that are essentially statistical based on experience whereas engineering is based on predictions that are based on analysis so the predictive paradigm in medicine is one that utilizes engineering methodology design analysis optimization iterating through those processes to get the product if you will that you want that utilizes computer modeling and simulation and perhaps the most important aspect of it it's patient specific models you want to build models of individual patients because you want to say something about what will happen to them when an intervention is performed rather than there's a 50% chance of this working or not working and you predict the outcomes so I'll give a few examples from work that we've done in developing patient specific mathematical models one of the things that we have done is developed a toolkit that allows you to build arterial systems together as you can see there are a few topics that I'm not going to present there they're grayed out one of the interesting ones that we've worked quite assiduously on lately is 
the, the topic of vulnerable plaques. These are the types of plaques that are responsible for two-thirds of heart attacks and uh, the development of drug delivery systems for them. What's interesting in that, in that uh, application is that you work from the nanoscale all, all the way up to the, uh, to the organ level scale. Uh, but that's a long story. So I'll just uh, take, tell some simple stories about uh, abdominal aortic modeling and then an LVAD. Well, uh, where does the data come from? In engineering, you design things, but uh, in medicine, you have to take what you get, and you get it primarily from uh, various imaging modalities. So this is an example of computed tomography, and this is the this will create a data set called a DICOM file that will be the origins of what we use to build mathematical models. I sometimes like to say that the people in the audience who may have seen me naked will recognize actually this is me here. <laughs> but you can see now we've sort of stripped away things that we're not interested in. We have to continue that process. And uh, for this model, we're going to develop uh, uh, an aortic model. So we'll get rid of the kidneys and the spine, et cetera. So the aorta here is in green and some of the branching vessels will be incorporated in the model. So you go through a number of steps. We call it a model development pipeline where you use many different computer science technologies that start with this lattice of uh, numbers that uh, somehow represent everything. And out of that fuzzy uh, data set, you can start to build things that are actually geometries initially. And as you can see from the middle, what we've gone is from this sort of, let's say, fuzzy rendition, a volume rendering, to one that consists of surfaces. And then from that, we go to surfaces, we take away the things we're uninterested in, and we calculate pathways. So this is how the model will start to look as you start to assemble some of the branches in. And you can see it's, in essence, it's done piece by piece. And these pieces are templates. And in their canonical form, they have these regular shapes. This is a, these are templates for trifurcations. And you can see they're discretized on the far right. But then uh, what occurs is uh, you, you model not only the solid wall, which is important in many applications, its deformability, and uh, also the blood flow. And you can do a very, very nice resolution because these are template-based and you can worry about things about uh, refinement in boundary layers to get accurate results, et cetera. So these are all embedded in these templates, and then the templates are uh, mapped to the patient's specific anatomy. So this is what it looks like after a few steps, and on the far right is the sim uh, just a snapshot of simulation results. So th those are just uh, the velocity vector uh, magnitudes. The wall is actually moving, so the wall has velocity here. So let me give you an application of how we use things like this. Uh, this is to a left ventricular assist device. And if you're unfamiliar with these, these are typically uh, implanted in patients that are waiting for heart transplants. Now what you see here is a uh, so-called ascending aortic, aortic distal anastomosis. And what that means is this tube that comes out of the pump is sutured to the ascending branch of the abdominal aorta, of the uh, thoracic aorta, I should say. Uh, what you do on right here, if I can get this to come alive, is you actually bore a hole in the left ventricle, and then you have a tube sutured to that, then a pump, and that pump assists a deficient heart. That's the idea. Now, this is a pump that is uh, utilized these days. It's the Jarvik 2000. And in the schematic here, you see that actually the anastomosis here is on the descending aorta rather than the ascending branch as before. Now, what we're not doing here is investigating the, uh, the pump itself. Those are well engineered. What we're investigating is the implications of where you put that anastomosis, and they are profoundly different, it turns out. So here's, again, a patient-specific model. And this was a healthy uh, under-35 volunteer. That's what we call graduate students. And um, we're going to implement, nevertheless, despite the fact he's healthy, an LVAD right here. 
and this is sort of the progression of the modeling. This is a snapshot of results, and this is sort of just a, a, a visualization uh, of an analysis. So you see it's beating with the heart, you're getting the deformability of the wall, and uh, the blood flow is being calculated. Now what we want here is pre as precise as we can get uh, analytical results that may have something to do with uh, complications that have been associated with uh, this type of an, uh, anastomosis. So here are three cases that we've studied. Uh, the left case looks sort of uh, generic, but somewhat normal. Uh, actually, it is a deficient heart. The, uh, the flow rate is lower than normal, so the, uh, some, some metrics that uh, emanate from the analysis will be lower than normal. Here, you can see it's actually much more deficient. The LVAD now is uh, uh, providing much of the blood flow. And here, you can see the, the heart is doing almost nothing, and most of the blood flow is coming from the LVAD. So three settings, pump off, then two with pump on, 8,000 and 10,000 revolutions per minute. Now, if you look at the uh, outflow branches, um, you don't see anything that really uh, distinguishes one, one situation or another. So blood flow is being created. It's going to the right branches. Uh, but in fact, there are some vast differences here. The details are what counts. This is what's happening in the area of the anastomosis. You see you're getting a very, very complex flow patterns. These are definitely non-physiologic, and they are the cause for concern, and we'll see why in a moment. Uh, when the pump is off and you almost have normal blood flow, you see you get very high, uh, high velocities in the, uh, uh, the abdominal aor the aortic arch. And uh, when the pump is on, you can see very, very different patterns. The, the velocity lowers quite a bit. This is a cause for concern. Uh, a very prominent cause for concern is if you look at mean shear stresses. These are sort of the the frictional forces on the uh, artery wall. Uh, this is a little low, as I said. This is a sort of a case where the, the, the blood flow is insufficient. So this is low, but you see it's somewhat uniform. What you'd like is unidirectional flow. There are focal areas where atherosclerosis forms in, uh, in, the, in the arteries, and they, they are uh, focal, as I said, but nevertheless, uh, the, the ones that you see to the right are very, very unusual. You get very, very low wall shear stresses here, averaged over a, a heartbeat. Very low ones over here. And extremely high ones over here. Now, why is this of concern? And why would this predict a problem? These are some uh, images from experiments that were done uh, illustrating how endothelial cells React, uh, react to fluid shear stresses. This is sort of the normal case. You have essentially unidirectional flow. You have reasonably high, but not too high, uh, shear stresses. And you can see the, the form of the striated pattern of the, uh, of the cells. So this is, this is viewed as healthy. This is what happens when the shear stress is very low. It's sort of oscillating a bit, and the mean is very low. You get sort of a cobblestone pattern that has been uh, associated with uh, plaque formation. And this shows some data from Malik, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Very low shear stresses are indicated right here. This has been identified as an atherosclerosis prone region when you have these low shear stresses. And then if you get very, very high ones, you have other problems like uh, blood clot formation. So the normal range is where you want to be. So from analyses like this, you'd predict problems. Now this isn't for a patient's specific case, but it's to, <clears throat> it's to predict the uh, efficacy of a particular intervention procedure. Uh, this is some data from the Texas Heart Institute, and this really compares uh, the original uh, ascending aortic anastomosis uh, versus the descending aortic anastomosis. And this is a, a groups of actual patients. And you can see when the ascending uh, anastomosis, it creates relatively physiologic blood flow. Not completely, but relatively. 
and the postoperative complications over nine patients was zero. And for the descending uh, anastomosis, you see there were multiple uh, postoperative complications. Uh, myocardial infarctions, those are heart attacks, these are blood clots, uh, the right ventricle failed here due to a heart attack, uh, blockages of uh, carotid arteries that lead to the brain, and uh, strokes as well. So things like this can really be more or less anticipated and predicted with analyses of this type. So presently, where are we with things like this? Well, for things like bypass grafts, uh, restoring blood flow, you, you can predict these things relatively accurately. You can tell what configuration you should use, whether you really get the type of blood flow you want. The models now that are being utilized in practice have uh, hundreds of uh, vessels, and they're very, very elaborate, and they're capable of doing this. Uh, but a main consideration, of course, is what are the implica implications of interventions after a period of time, three months, six months, a year, et cetera. And uh, examples that I think uh, many people are familiar with these days is when you implant stents to open up blood vessels, they often fail due to uh, immediate cell proliferation, so-called intimal thickening, restenosis, and blood clot formation. These are functions of time. They don't happen immediately. They involve chemistry, physiological responses to the mechanical stimuli that uh, are pressure, shear stresses that are introduced by the intervention. So what is happening is there's a, a tremendous amount of work trying to go from the, the cellular level, the small scale, and upscale to the organ level, and developing growth and adaptation models for uh, various, uh, various things uh, uh, that are uh, the response uh, of, of interventions, disease processes, et cetera. So uh, I'm working in particular right now on aneurysm development, and we're developing growth and adaptation models for that. And it seems that uh, these types of processes, we're sort of on the threshold of modeling them and giving some predictions to outcomes on the computer. I think it's interesting to note that the uh, school of Koss, the uh, physicians that were influenced by the great Hippocrates, uh, they felt that it was extremely important to predict outcomes in order to reassure patients. And I know I think many people who have uh, experienced the disease and told what the percentage of uh, uh, success for a particular intervention is uh, know how disconcerting that can be. So if we can do a little bit better on an individual ed uh, level, I think it would be very, uh, very beneficial. So I'll just stop there and see if there are any questions.